As Senate approves Buhari's 22.7 trillion naira ways and means extra budgetary spending, not a few Nigerians are outraged at this last-minute borrowing. Now, questions have been raised about the competence of the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed. We shall be taking a look at this on the breakfast this morning. We also are going to be looking at the growth of spas in Nigeria and the health benefits, especially in a stressful place like Lagos. We will also be taking a look at the headlines on some major newspapers with off the press as we have a guest join us to dissect the headlines. Welcome back. We're glad to know that you're still there and watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And uh, we're going straight to what the headlines are uh, in the papers. We're beginning with the leadership newspaper that they just call Friday Leadership. And the first headline there on the leadership is Northern Youth's alleged plot to stop Tinubu's inauguration. Northern Youth's alleged plot to stop Tinubu's inauguration. Finger, Labour, IPOP, Petition, IGP, DSS demand Ajiro's arrest. Ajiro, the uh, uh, NLC leader. It's cheap blackmail, NLC president replies. Okay. Then we also have another headline. Uh, Sudan, we saw hell at borders. That is Nigerian returnees saying they saw hell at the borders. APC's victory saved PMB's legacy projects, presidency. Agricology's union rejects exclusion from 40% pay rise. How to shield judges from corruption? Uh, Tinubu is uh, giving solutions to that. And then we also have organ harvesting. UK court sentences Equerimadu wife today. So we'll find out whether all the writings, all the letters uh, will pay off uh, in this sentencing today. Those were the headlines from the leadership, Friday leadership that we have. And from leadership, we'll go to Nature News newspaper. Nature News leads with Nigeria, Mali, four others to face acute hunger this year. That's according to UN report. The writer there, over 250 million people hungry in 2022. Details of that is on page three of that newspaper. Uh, if you're looking at that right now, you see a picture of hungry children. Um, not a beautiful sight. People queue as food is distributed in Old Fungak in Jongle State, one of the areas of South Sudan affected by food insecurity. Okay, away from that, you have only GMOs confirmed safe will be permitted in Nigeria. And that's according to Yemisi Asa Bara, the newly appointed Director General, uh, CEO, National Biosafety Management Agency, saying that only safe GMOs. I don't know if there are safe GMOs. <laughs> GMOs. They must are have parameters that they use to yeah, measure the safety. I hope they do. Well, stakeholders. Well, you find details of that on page five. Moving on, stakeholders demand definite deadline for gas flaring by oil companies. Details of that is also on page five. On top there, you have, we are moving towards launching NICOMSAT 2. And that's according to the MD of the Nigerian Communication Satellite Limited. That's all I'll be taking from Nature News. Okay, I do hope that uh, when they launch that satellite, we will, we will see a lot of improvements in our tech and everything. We're moving to the punch. Uh, the punch is the next one. And on the punch, the leading headline there is, again, military warns saboteurs, go on councils, petitioners. That is on May 29 handover. The writers are, threat to new president's inauguration will be promptly dealt with, says defense headquarters. Kayamo knocks on Nikon for saying Tinubu shouldn't be sworn in before tribunal verdict. We also have troops kill 40 insurgents, rescue two Chibok girls. 70%, okay, uh, you have that um, on page 8 about the insurgents being killed. And the one about the military warning, uh, uh, 
warning saboteurs is on page two. Then 70% of Southwest private school teachers unqualified. That is according to uh, TRCN. You'll see that on page 27. A uh, 25-year-old dredging firm worker drowns in Lagos River. That's an unfortunate one there. And that story is on page 4. We don't know who that is. Sudan, second batch of stranded Nigerians arrives today. On page 7, that's where the story is. I do hope that they will arrive safely as well as the uh, first batch did. Federal roads. Uh, on page 19, federal roads. Federal government pays states 859.7 billion naira in eight years. And we also have government agencies, military, or electricity firms, that is Senate, talking. Page 19 is where you find the story. And reps raise Buhari's extra budgetary spending to 23.7 trillion naira. You find that also on page 19. That's it. All right, so we'll go to the next newspaper, which is the Nation newspaper. And it leads with outbursts on inauguration. Onenye comes under fire. Riders there. Senior lawyers knock cleric for questioning president elect swearing in and defense headquarters. Nothing will stop May 29th event. That's coming from the defense headquarters. At Damawa wreck, others get bail, declaring Benani not wrong, he insists. That you find details of that on page 5 of the Nation newspaper. President-elect promises judicial reform, judges' welfare, a priority. You find details of that on page 4. And House OK's one trillion naira loan for federal government, details on page 7. 70% of private school teachers in Southwest unqualified. Details of that you'll find on page 25 of the Nation newspaper. Okay, um, that will be about all that we have on Off the Press. And um, we're going to, we are now joined actually by our um, uh, analyst for the day. And he is a senior lecturer at Nigerian Institute of Journalism at Lagos State in the person of Mr. Jide Johnson. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Johnson. Good morning, it's a pleasure. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be with you and good morning to our viewers all over the world. Thank you for having me. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, well, most of the newspapers carried something on the inauguration, the May 29. Uh, Northern Youth's alleged plot to stop Tinubu's inauguration is on leadership. Uh, the army Military won saboteurs, Gowan Council's petitioners, on May 29 handover. Uh, it must not be scuttled in any way. Uh, so we'd like your comment on that. Let's begin with that before we move on to other issues. Now, if you raise it does, you must also identify the source of the dust. Um, just coming on the pages of newspaper or gathering somewhere and granting a press conference to say that some people are planning to sabotage the inauguration without you coming with specific details, is that you are trying to heighten the polity. As far as I'm concerned, the not that you should finger those that think that um, really wants to sabotage the inauguration of the president, of the president-elect. The entire inauguration of the president-elect is a constitutional matter and is an issue that state institutions are charged with. There are various state institutions that are charged with the responsibility, the president-elect through the secretary to the federal government and other agencies of government have critical role to play in the inauguration. So I don't see how people that do not have access to state power, that do not have access to state institution, we circumvent um, the, the, the process. However, some will pontificate just to justify uh, whatever funding they want to get from, from anybody in terms of who, which group. The question is, who are these faceless group? When did they come into existence? Are they registered group? Are they political action committee or just individuals guarding themselves? Um, and then making statements, statements that could eat up, eat up the, 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 the polity. So as far as 
as far as I'm concerned, you know me paying much attention to it. However, you see the media give prominence to that story. You begin to ask yourself the question, what was the editorial decision behind making that story the major headline in that particular publication? Because I don't want to mention that, that, that publication because I cannot be an editor of a newspaper and such story is filed in and then I use that story as the major, as the major headline. On the issue of the military warning saboteur, there's no need for you to warn any saboteur. Anyone that tries to walk contrary to the lay down principle and procedure of our, our state is governed. Anyone that threatens the territorial integrity of our nation, anyone that tries to abuse or break law and order in the nation, there are institutions that are responsible for that. In actual sense, the military has no role to play in this. Now, the military coming in, in democracy, the military will, must be seen and not be heard. Now, when there are saboteurs, when there are people that are trying to circumvent, there are state institutions like the police, like the DSS, that should deal with that. The military has no role, but, but a lot of role, a lot of prominence has been given to the military, and the military is arrogating to itself powers that belong to other security agencies in a civilian administration. So as far as I'm concerned, it is it is it is it is it is the failure of the military to understand its own core function, core function of protecting the territorial integrity of Nigeria, of ensuring that no part of, of Nigeria is encroached on. You have never you will not see military coming out with statements. In the last one month or thereabout, we have seen too many statements from the military with respect to um, transition, uh, whether there will be inauguration in May 29 or no May 29, and it cut across the parties, both the party that won the election and the party that is contesting the election. A lot of um, invitations have been made, whereas the military have not made statements concerning protecting Yobi, uh, Madamawa, <laughs> Bonu, and where we have insurgencies, and where we have um, we have we have banditry in, in Zamfara, and the rest of it in, in Nigeria. So as far as I'm concerned, military has no role in democracy. Their role is to protect the territorial integrity. And we shouldn't ascribe too much relevance. And we shouldn't ascribe too much power with respect to preserving democracy to the military. The military can preserve democracy. It's not in their core function. There are institutions of state that are charged with that responsibility. And those ones should wake up to your responsibility. It's just like prior to the election. And we were talking about security. And then we saw the chief of army staff uh, granting a press conference. And the inspector general of police was behind him. When it comes to protecting and pro providing um, security for election, it's not the responsibility of the military. And if the military wants to come into that, they turn to the National Guard and you have a special arm trained. Military are not trained to maintain law and order. No, it's not within their core function. And where you have it in other civilized life, they are called the National Guard and they are trained for that specific purpose. But here, are they trained for that uh, specific, specific purpose? I, 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 I don't know. But there are issues that cause for concern with respect to as we are advancing our democracy. Now, you could see that the, the first thing the president-elect made, he made a pronouncement, a policy statement. It's not been sworn in, but he made a, 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 a very, very instructive policy statement that there will be judicial reform. There will be judicial reform. It's not been sworn in. And one of the critical organs of government that is going to determine the final outcome of all the elections we had in 20 is the judiciary, a situation whereby the executive have a role in playing in reforming the judiciary. It's not good for our polity. That means that um, and then it has been identified, and that itself could lead to the judiciary being compromised. That's why some people have some fears, and that's why some have advocated. And I'm advocating, and I'm joining this advocacy, that one of the things we need to look at in terms of our laws, in terms of constitutional amendment, is for us to finish all issues relating to the election before inauguration. Before, for example, I contest an election with you into for the governor of our state, and I won the election. And then you took me to court. Why I've been sworn in? While I'm in court, I'm the governor. I'm the governor exec, uh, uh, using executive power, and then I'm fighting litigation. Where do I get the resources to fight the litigation? There's, a, there's every tendency 
that I'll be using the state resources to my advantage, state institution to my advantage, against the person that is contesting the election with me. So there is a leverage that I've gotten by having access to state power, to state authority, to state institution, while fighting the other, the person that is contesting my election. So I think that some of the issues um, that have been raised by, let's say, uh, Bishop Onayeko and others over time that election petition material should be dealt with should be an issue that the Trent Assembly should look into. Mm -hmm. All issues, we conducted election February 25. Now, if you have done everything with respect to this, February 25 to May 29, is three months that's 90 days now even if we choose 60 days 60 days accelerated hearing to deal with the matter i think you have 60 days window to solve the problem or if there is a need for us to bring the election say six months before before handing over and then you you deal with every issue that has to do with litigation concerning the election and then, you know, once the president is sworn in, once the governor is sworn in, once the legislator is sworn in, he does not have to be going to court, attending to court issues, and at the same time attending to state matters. That is, a, is, is distraction. That is a, has contributed to the fact of us not getting the deliverables of democracy. Because when the governor is in court, how can he concentrate in running, in running, in running, in running, in running the government? So... I agree with those that have advocated that there is a need for us to not inaugurate pre president or governor until we finish the inauguration. Yeah, Deal with all legal matters relating to it, Mr. and then you solve, you solve that problem. Yeah, Mr. Johnson, yeah. You, you have not only just thoroughly trashed mm -hmm. this matter, but you've also established the fact that you are a senior lecturer <laughs> of the Nigerian <laughs> Institute of Journalism <laughs> by letting us know what qualifies to be on the headlines of a newspaper, and I, I just love that. But let's move on to another headline there from Steel on the Punch newspaper, talking about troops kill 40 insurgents, rescue two Chiba girls. You have picture over there of uh, two Chiba girls who have been rescued with their babies in their hands. Well, um, it's, un it's unfortunate that um, even the Punch newspaper um, is reporting this story without them um, blindfolding the the girls that were rescued and the babies in their hand. It is against the ethics of the profession and it's against the principle of reporting the child uh, because uh, this these images will last forever and people can use it to stigmatize stigmatize this these children when they grow up and also even these ladies that have been that have been rescued as a result of um, them being kidnapped and being abused by their abductors. So, as, uh, for me, there seems to be a lot of glory hunting. Glory hunting on the part of the military with respect to their core, with respect to their core function of protecting the territorial integrity of, 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 of the nation. As far as I'm concerned, I will not use, if I, I will not use this as the major. Well, if you understand the way the media works, and I can tell you for a fact, that this is more of a PR, this is an editorial picture, this is an headline picture, this is more of a PR, this is more of a PR picture, if you know the way the media works. So if I were to look at it, I would even pay attention, I wouldn't even pay attention. In most cases, in most cases, these pictures are paid for. These pictures are paid for. So it's, it's of no news value, it's of no relevance as far as I'm concerned. Okay, let's look at something that you may consider uh, <laughs> newsworthy, and that has to do with the GMOs um, that's on Nature's newspaper, uh, where you have uh, Yemisi Osagwara uh, talking about GMOs. She says, only GMOs confirmed safe will be permitted in Nigeria. Talk to us about this. She is uh, the newly appointed Director General, CEO, National Biosafety Management Agency. Well, um, that's, that's the call. There's the bottom line, the, the agency has a core mandate, and the core mandate is to regulate, is to regulate that industry. And so it's, it's the core mandate. So what should we expect from, ah, uh, there's an operating standard procedure 
there is a requirement for those that want to participate in that sector and they should stick to that that's 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 the that's the barest minimum that is required of any regulatory agency to ensure that there is compliance and due diligence for both operators and stakeholders in any sector of nigerian economy in any sector of the nigeria of nigeria of nigeria like but you know she's just assuming office and she's laying down the gauntlet and she's saying that it's not going to be business as usual we are going to stick to the principle we are going to stick to the process and the procedure that governs this industry let's wait and see whether she carried out um, a, 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 a directive a, a policy statement with respect to, to how the the agency will operate under under our watch we wish her, we wish her all the best and we hope that she has the confidence and we are with her to carry through all what she has said you know i found that interesting that very headline because i had interviewed someone who is an agriculturist and she said that nigeria does not consume organic foods and i was alarmed because I, <laughs> it was one of the things we boasted about mm -hmm. that we eat organic here but then she said that and you know and then there have been questions about gmos how safe are they and I, as, as i read that headline i asked uh, nyango are there any safe gmos out there well as you said let's watch and see how this pans out Okay, let's stay with the nature news there. Uh, there's a headline there that uh, is really troubling. 24 days to go for a government that prides itself as having delivered uh, their campaign promises, everything that they have, they, they promised Nigerians they have delivered. That's what the presidency is saying. And uh, not only have they done that, but they also say that in agriculture, they can be rated like 100%. Now, this headline on Nature News from the UN report says that Nigeria, alongside Mali and four other countries, will fit acute hunger this year. So I'd like your comment on that. This government says that's been well, um, delivered, but what this is need, coming. What you need to do is to look at the cost, the, uh, the cost of living and the cost of goods, or the price index of commodity goods and even now so essential and then you ask what what was it eight years ago uh, what is it now um, and then you do a comparison you do a comparative analysis and then you come to a conclusion because it's comparative analysis that gives you a clear picture of what it was and what it is so for government coming you see they can do pr for themselves they can pride themselves like a gamma lizard that fell from the roko tree and keep nodding their head that they've done well what do you expect? You are asking me to devalue myself. I will always value myself above what even value that, that I have. It's the report, the reports of United Nations is there. You, you all just take a trip, take a trip around Nigeria. What, even in Lagos, look at the number of people begging on the street, asking you for money. And then for those that have meaningful jobs like you and I, how many dependents call on you on daily basis, on monthly basis, asking for one relief fund or the other? So it's clear the reality of what we face in Nigeria. Okay, why would government say that, okay, because of cost of living, they are increasing the salaries of federal civil servants in order to combat the, uh, the hyperinflation, the double-digit inflation that we have, the, the double-digit inflation that we have in Nigeria presently. So if they've done well, well, uh, they, they would have inflation, the cost of goods and services wouldn't be won't would, be won't be on 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 the rise and then um you won't see people begging you for relief packages on the street so it's it's just they are just playing to the gallery what i usually tell people is this history is a determinant of your performance or non-performance history is does not lie history will place you in the rightful place you belong to and whenever you are given an opportunity in leadership position don't just understand that you are writing your story because the word history is is, is is story. So you are writing your story. Whatever actions or inactions, time will tell. It's becoming critical clear to the president that all those that are around him were just were just presinking him. Now all attention has shifted from the president, from the president to the president elect. He will soon discover that out of power is 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 solitary. 
okay. in Nigeria, well, it will well, soon be discovered. President, by the President, Buhari, Buhari, President Buhari already discovered that and said if we disturb him a lot, he would just he will run to Niger. He has. The president has no problem with being forgotten at all. But let's move on to Sudan, uh, the Sudan story, our children who have been, our people who have been brought back from there. And that's uh, Friday leadership where it is captured. We saw hell at borders, Nigerian returnees. Uh, give us your thoughts on all that's played out. And well, today we hear that some of them, 300 of them, have arrived at Abuja. We saw clips of that as well. I think the problem we have is a lack of coordination. Lack of coordination and um, internal competition between ministries, departments, and agencies of government. The question you ask is which, which ministry is responsible for this evacuation? Um, is it Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Or is it an agency under an agency in the presidency need come? Or is it NEMA under Ministry of Humanitarian uh, Services? So we, 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 have, we face the dilemma which the United States of America faced in 9-11, when agencies were not sharing information with one another and there was no collaboration. And as a result of that, the United States of America established Homeland Department of Homeland Security, which allows CIA, ICE, other state institutions, security institutions, to collaborate and to share, to share information. We have been... We have seen what happened with Ukraine, the evacuation of Nigeria from Ukraine. We have seen what happened in Libya, when Nigerians were stranded in Libya. And we have seen what is happening in, in Sudan. And there's every likelihood that if there's an outbreak in another country, you have a lot of Nigerians who face similar things. I think that there's a need for us to create a template, a template of how are we going to evacuate our citizens when they are in the face of conflict. Uh, because, look, and I pointed it out earlier this week, that you have ambassadors, you have various officers in Nigeria. Nigeria has an embassy in Sudan. Nigeria has a foreign relation with Sudan. What were we looking at? And why were we not proactive in, in ensuring that Nigerians were evacuated as quickly as possible before the issue escalated? You see, you could see the carnage. It's carnage going on. Now, when such thing is happening, what is the natural reaction of nations? They will close their border because you don't want infiltration. One, infiltration. Two, you don't want migration. You don't want infiltration of that crisis to dovetail into your country. Two, you don't want upsurge of, migra of migrants into refugees into your own country. So the natural reaction, if it happens to neighboring countries in Ni around Nigeria, our natural reaction will be to close our borders. So it, there's not, it's nothing new. It's, it's the way nations react to conflicts in countries that share borders with them. But it is the responsibility of the Nigerian government to be proactive in taking actions. You could see that we are here. The story they gave us, the hired bus is 1.2 million. Oh, the president intervened. By calling, by calling the president of Egypt. Was the president intervene? What is the minister of foreign affairs doing? Oh, and but when the people that were evacuated, we are now hearing their own story. Their own story is contradicting the stories our officials have given us. But you know, people, there are no consequences for bad action. The same set of people, you will see them being appointed into offices by, by the president-elect because it is the same party that is in power today that has won the election as that of today until the court ruled otherwise. Tibolad Ahmed Dinubu is the president-elect. If the court insists that is the president, it will be the president of the 2027. So you, it might not be out of place for you to still fight this same set of people. Being rewarded is in Nigeria that will reward incompetence. Mm -hmm. Is in Nigeria you will reward bad behavior. Is in Nigeria you reward people that lack capacity to undo situations and to be in leadership position to solve problems and you know when they do little things they come on the air and they will be gallivating and pontificating as if they've done something something big you for, for crying out loud you're a public servant you are meant to serve us if you are not ready to serve us why do you offer yourself for public service so the government and its agencies and its personnel must be proactive and we have not been proactive in dealing with this issue thank you so also, much the citizenry and the role to play let me just quickly add this. The ah. citizenry has the role to play. When you travel outside of Nigeria, you have a responsibility, legitimately, as a migrant, 
as a legal matter, you have a role to register yourself with the embassy. Let the embassy know about your wear with that in a foreign country. It is easier for them to track you. It is easier for them to locate you. It is in your own interest for you to do that. Because yeah. government has its role, the citizens themselves also have a role. Thank in a situation you know, whereby we don't know you, are, we don't know whether you are in a country, we can identify you. And when there is crisis, you are running to us. Is it responsible on your own part? Thank you so, so much. Because we must have a balance. Thank you, Mr. Jide Johnson, senior lecturer at Nigerian Institute of Journalism, Lagos State. Thank you for your time and insight. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. And thank you for having me. Have a wonderful weekend. You, you too. too. Well, the program continues in a moment as we look at our first hot topic. Stay with us.